Can you hear me? Yeah. Doug, the other day, a week ago, you called me, and I was, I was on the plane up in the sky, and I'd forgot to turn my phone off when you called. And of course, it rang, and the whole world, you know, looked, and, oh my God, you know, they thought I was a terrorist or something. So that's why I haven't answered you. One was I was on a plane and it would look bad, and the other one was I was gone. So love you. We'll talk to you eventually. All right. Um, we were uh, looking at some of these things <clears throat> um, in our last class, and we're still sort of laying the groundwork for this. A um, couple of things that need to be understood. And so I've sort of laid them out on a timeline now, the three main ones that we're going to be dealing with. And that is Moses' tabernacle, David's tabernacle, and Solomon's temple. <clears throat> and um, Moses' tabernacle was primarily in the wilderness, um, but it was also established at Shiloh once they entered into the land. And that was for a, a fairly short amount of time. But nonetheless, you have to understand that when we're talking about Moses' tabernacle, we're talking about the existence of that tabernacle in a certain period of time. And that was God set it up in the wilderness, remember? And then it continued into the land for a period of time. And then that's when... Um, they took the, the priests took the ark out into battle, and the Philistines won the battle and took the ark of the covenant, and it was in the possession of the Philistines for a period of time. And then after that, and that's why I've got, starting over here, Moses' tabernacle, then after that, um, David won the battle against them, took the ark, carried it back, and instead of putting it in Shiloh, the ark never returned to Moses' tabernacle again. Okay? Now, of course, this is all historical stuff, but it all has spiritual meaning, and we're, gonna, we're going to lay out the timeline of this more clearly as we go, but maybe tonight, although it's, it's actually getting pretty late because of a lot of different things, we may not have enough time tonight. But if we lay out just the timeline, the next week we'll start by, by laying out a spiritual timeline as God saw it. And it's, it's, um, it's pretty incredible because God's timeline is exact with the meaning, but not exact with the time as we would understand it. And I'll explain that as we get into it. <clears throat> All right. Um, also, understanding that David's tabernacle was set up on Mount Zion, and Moses' tabernacle was not on Mount Zion. It was in Shiloh. Uh, this is significant because if you read the Psalms, um, David wrote so many of those psalms, and we don't even realize this, but <clears throat> he talks a lot about, oh, I, how I love your courts. You're familiar with that? Better is one day in your courts and all that. Folks, he never went down to Moses' tabernacle. He's talking about Zion. And he even says it over and over. But we don't even know what Zion is if we don't understand the Bible. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, this is, uh, I'll write it under here so we... David's tabernacle is Zion. And so you'll read incredible amounts of Psalms where David is just like, oh, I love your tabernacle. And, I, and when, I, when I went into the tabernacle of the Lord, you know, and he says all that stuff, <clears throat> he is not talking about Shiloh at all. He is talking about the tent set up behind his house that was simply the Holy of Holies. <clears throat> it didn't include the rest of it. Remember? Because they, 
they, all they did in the Moses Tabernacle, it had the holy place and it had the altar and it had the laver and it had the altar of incense and it had the table of showbread and it had the seven branch candlestick and it had the, the walls around it and it had all of that stuff. And when they grabbed the ark, which represented the presence of God because that's where the presence of God dwelt, they took it out of there and lost the ark and when David brought it back he just made a holy of holies <laughs> and that's where he went in that's when he talks about how he loves the tabernacle of the Lord and all that stuff that's what he's talking about he had his own private holy of holies and he went in there and he wasn't a priest wasn't even supposed to go in there okay um, let me say this before I go too far um, Jill, I'm glad you're writing and everything, but you're not a Bible school student in the sense of you have to worry about all of this information and stuff. Just relax, and if the Lord shares something with you, good, enjoy it, taste it, and whatever, but there is no pressure, okay? This isn't your regular Bible school stuff, okay? <clears throat> and I, I feel that from the Lord. When the Lord told me you were coming, he told me to protect you from yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and from others of laying heavy loads on you. So I'm doing it in good faith and love, okay? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> um, so uh, these realities, you know, they don't even come together in our heads. So you even get scriptures in the New Testament talking about Zion and, you know, the book of Hebrews and stuff like that. We're going, well, you know, we, we somehow get it all mixed up and everything. And God, as we'll see when we lay this out in a timeline and when we see it, the spiritual timeline, because the spiritual timeline fits it, um, he's got an exact order of what he's bringing about and why and how he's doing it. And if for no other reason, folks, um, how are we going to understand the fulfillment if we don't even know the shadow from which it came? If you understand what I mean. I mean, you know, we're, we're trying to understand the fulfillment of what? There's no, do you understand what I'm saying? We don't even understand what it was that he's fulfilling. So we're not trying to move with the Lord in fulfillment. We're just trying to, we're just like, you know, American Christians or Irish Christians and we're just trying to follow God in some religion called Christianity and for the most part folks much of the way Christianity has been set up is not the fulfillment of it and and they have no explanation for these multitude of scriptures in the New Testament that continually are referring back to the tabernacle or the temple and then it's saying you know for example uh, uh, the Bible says, well, you are the temple of the Lord. Well, what does that mean to a New Testament Christian? Well, it should mean the fulfillment of the old, but you got to know what the old was about to even comprehend it. But if you don't understand the old, then you just go, oh, it just means God lives in us. Well, okay. You know, I mean, he didn't just live any old way in that there were... There was an order of sacrifices and things, and all of that's supposed to be life, and all of that's supposed to be coming about being fulfilled in us by Christ. The law, and, and that's what it says in Romans 8, isn't it? That the, that the law is fulfilled in us who walk by, what is it? I forget the exact wording, but it's Romans 8, verse 2 or 3. And, and it's saying, and, and listen again, that it's being fulfilled in us, not kept by us. Big difference. One is, guess what, dude? You better carry the load. And the other one is, I need Christ. I need him now. I need him as life. And I need him as the fulfiller of these things so that you know and here we go if, if he's the fulfiller then he brings fulfillment but not just to you but to god he's bringing fulfillment to what god had in mind when he made this shadow all of these shadows he had something spiritual behind it that could be fulfilled by christ but christ in the true temple 
Christ in the true temple. So we'll get into all that. But um, so um, now, and just you know, just a little side note because we're gonna, as you can see on our chart, we're gonna primarily be dealing with Solomon's temple, and that's why Mallory in the last class mentioned that because um, that's the that's Solomon's temple is the true representation of what all of this is supposed to culminate in. And we'll see a progression from tabernacle to temple as we go here. <clears throat> but, um, but there were other temples. I mean, there were, I mean, I wrote down, and this was just off the cuff, honestly, just before I left, I wrote down, a, apart from Solomon's temple, I wrote down four other temples that existed. And I'm, there may have been more. That was just me just quickly going, okay, let me think. Da, 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 da. Okay, so, so, the, so the alternative to Solomon's temple, the first one is what I call Zerubbabel's temple. That's the temple that went, remember, uh, well, let's just go through it. Let's just, you know, we're not in a rush here, so let's just, let's just go through it. When they were, uh, I think, isn't Kelly teaching on Jeremiah this, this, okay. Well, Jeremiah was prophesying captivity, remember? And at the end of Jeremiah, they're all in captivity except for a few poor people that end up going down into Egypt and Jeremiah's among them. Well, they're 70 years into captivity and what happened when they took them all away was they, they tore down the temple and burned it, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And so 70 years later, there's a small remnant that comes back and they start rebuilding the temple. And that's called Zerubbabel's temple. It wasn't anything like Solomon's temple. And if you remember any of the prophet's stories, they're sitting around and some of them are so happy just to be out of Babylon and in God's temple, but it's all these burnt stones and everything, you know, that's been set up. And, and some, but some of them are just so happy to be back in God's temple. They're shouting and laughing. And some of them are crying. If you read the, you, you know, they're crying and weeping because it's nothing like what Solomon's temple. And then one of them says, one of the prophets says, the glory of this temple shall be greater than the former temple. It didn't say the temple would be greater. It said the glory of it would be. See, so in other words, quit crying, babies. There's going to be something really of God in this, you know. <clears throat> get, get your eyes on the Lord, not on your circumstances, you know. And uh, my study, I remember studying like Nehemiah and, and all those books when they were rebuilding the wall, rebuilding the temple. And, and I, I was pastoring at the time when the Lord began to show me the reality there and they were they were taking what was broken and what was torn down and what was burnt with fire and I saw those stones you know and the Bible calls us living stones you know and I saw those stones was all burnt out <laughs> you know they were burnt out and yet they were gathering them together and they were putting they were putting them back together so that they weren't just individual stones. They were a habitation of God. And God was even taking the burnt out ones and putting it back together. And I just, I just rejoice in that, you know, because he chooses the foolish things of the world. And, I mean, can we get any more of that in this church, in this fellowship, you know? You know, we are it. We are the pinnacle of the foolish things of the world. And yet... Look at him. He's dwelling in us. He's living in us. There's life in this place because, it's, because we choose not to just live as Christians but as a habitation of God. And if that's our heart, folks, guess who's going to show up? And, even, and it's the only thing that will save a, a burnout stone. If you burn out, folks, the last thing in the world you want to hear is more work more religion. That's the last thing. You do not want it. You want something that's got life and life more abundant. And, you know, we hear, we hear all that preaching. We hear those scriptures quoted. But where is it? Well, that's Christ. I am come that you might have life. Well, I didn't, he didn't say I came to give life. Remember, he said, I am the life. I am come that you might have life. And as life, he's the fulfillment by, you know, what Shay said, he's the fulfillment by life of what God always wanted 
and what they fail to recognize in the shadow, okay? All right, so we got Zerubbabel's temple. Uh, how about, uh, let's say, I didn't put them in order here, but <clears throat> um, the temple just before Jesus came. What was the name of it? Herod's, Herod's temple, okay? And he was, an, he was not a Jew. He was an Edomian, which meant what? Arab, Arab or what? Edomite, or I thought Edomia might have even been all the way back to Ishmael, but I think it is, yeah. <clears throat> wow, we got Ishmael building a temple for God, you know. So, so, you know, just so you know, this isn't the full meaning of it. So you see Jesus coming into that temple and say, tear this temple down and I'll raise one up in three days. That's going to be the real thing. And this spoke he of his body folks. All right. So, um, and then we also have, and this is where some people get confused, but we also have Ezekiel's temple. And I'm going to go ahead and say the next one so that we can see if you're confused. Ezekiel's temple was the third one I had on my list, and the Millennium Temple was the fourth one. A lot of people think that they're the same thing, and they're not. The dimensions are completely different much about them and the description that Ezekiel gives and then what you find in the book of Revelation and some other places, completely different, completely different measurements in certain areas and certain things. So I just throw that out for your <clears throat> fun to search out if you ever get the chance, you know, and uh, the Lord starts leading you in, in that way. Um, uh, Let's see. So these are, the, these are the three main ones. Moses' tabernacle, David's tabernacle, and Solomon's temple. Um, let me just read a little paragraph I wrote this morning. Now this contrast between a tabernacle and a temple is very important. This contrast between a tabernacle and a temple is very important. Now remember, I did say that sometimes the words are used interchangeably. And you can get a little confused with that. But there really is, in the scriptures, a basic line that is showing a difference between the tabernacle and the temple and what God had in mind. And remember, one was the tabernacle of Moses, but David's tabernacle is still a tabernacle in that sense. <clears throat> All right. So um, now this contrast between a tabernacle and a temple are very important. This will be the primary subject of many of our first sessions. Now is the time to tune in to the Lord and sharpen our ears to hear when a particular emphasis is placed on the tabernacle and what that emphasis is and when a particular emphasis is placed on the temple and what that emphasis pertains to. Up to this point, we've only been laying a foundation so that we might rightly perceive what it is that God wants to communicate to us concerning the house of God. All right, I'm going to go ahead and uh, get into... Uh, just one more part here, and uh, I was blessed. I was really, really blessed that the Lord, uh, when I was in, <laughs> so funny, when I was in uh, Holland, uh, he shared a tremendous amount with me when I was laying there hurting. I'd just been, I'd, I'd taught two sessions. I was worn out. I was jet lagging everything and I said Lord when I get back I'm gonna to have to teach this and I, I cannot go in there and just talk I must have life fresh life you've heard me teach the tabernacle I know my way around teaching the tabernacle I don't want to just teach stuff I know I you know what I want to teach stuff I don't know I want you know what I mean I want to I want to learn more I want us to be in this process together I I, I don't want just teacher and student I want this to be the family sitting at the table and finding the Lord and, and getting what it is of the Lord. And anyway, when I was there, he gave me um, a wonderful chart that I'm going to just put out now. And I entitled this chart, The Historical and Spiritual Progression of the House of God. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm only going to give you the historical progression of the house of the Lord. And then next time when we get together, I'll lay over it because that's going to be our template. I'm going to lay over it the spiritual progression of what God had in mind. <clears throat> so um, I partially got it up here. 
And uh, I may have to just not hold this because the, so on my chart here, even though I've got first on a timeline, Moses' tabernacle, David's tabernacle, Solomon's tabernacle, I'm repeating this for the people who may not be able to see everything so that they can know that there's a chart and a progression. Uh, before the, uh, the tabernacle, before Moses' tabernacle, there was uh, from Abraham, so we're going to put from Abe, so don't think that's Abe Lincoln, to Moses, okay? From Abraham to Moses was part of that progression. <clears throat> and that period of time, and you, you know it, I mean, it, it, it's actually even before Abraham. It, it goes all the way back to uh, Noah. It goes back to Enoch. And that was that all of those people had an individual relationship with God. And, and their, their um, altar was just one that they built anywhere. There was no temple, there was no tabernacle. It all was related to God up in heaven. You following me? God up in heaven and God far away. Basically, you know what I'm describing? Many Christians. He's up in heaven, he's far away, I'm trying to get hold of him. I, I ring and ring and he won't answer, you know. <laughs> That's what Doug says about me. <clears throat> and, and that was the, the relationship, folks. That was the relationship that men had with God. But at a certain juncture, God came down and he said, I want to dwell with you. And we went over this in that Habitation of God series in, in detail. But at a certain juncture, the relationship Changed. It completely changed, and God was no longer far away. He was in their midst. Okay? That's real important to realize. If you, if you don't, it's, it is very important to realize that the way that it was set up was when they came out of Egypt, they were just this big gang. I mean, you know, and when they walked along in the wilderness, you know, you just kind of went, you know, you're talking to Bill and Susie here, and you go, hey, it's Bob over there. And I'm sure their names were a little different than the, you know. <laughs> you know, they go, hey, hey, Bob. You know, and then you walk over there, and then you, you know, and so you just go, and, and you know, if you're walking along singing songs, you go, hey, let's just sing some songs for the Lord. And you pick the song, and this your little group sings it. And, you know, since there's three million of us, who knows what's going on up there? You, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's a, it's a big, big line of people walking. <clears throat> and um, so when the tabernacle came, everything changed. They no longer walked any old way. They walked in a specific way, all based on God with them, the tabernacle, the house of God and God. Do you understand that? That's that, I mean that that their lives were rearranged. This is no longer the way it has been. Okay, and when they camped, and many of you have heard me share this before, but when they camped, the way the tabernacle was set up and the way the camp was set up was like a big cross. And if you could look from heaven, you would look down on it, and that's what you would see. It was a big cross. And the, the, the people were camped around it, and the tabernacle was in the center of the camp. And, and so it was like God is, you know, God is in the midst of us. And you remember scriptures said like that in the Old Testament. God is in the midst of us, you know. And uh, all of that, you know, it may not sound much to us, but for them, God had never been in the midst of them. Their understanding of God was not in the midst. It was far away. It was not Christ in them. It was Christ alive and well, you know, sitting on a throne somewhere, you know, and, you know, here's how you got hold of him. You threw a prayer up there, and you figure if that prayer can travel at the speed of light, it ought to hit him in a couple of months. You know, I mean, you know something like, something weird like that. I mean, that's how we do it. We go, you know. It's, it changed. God is in the midst of us. And they could, I mean, you know, that Shekinah glory represented the presence of God. They could, there's God right there, you know. And when God moved, they moved. Remember, when the Shekinah glory moved, they moved. Folks, all that was just a picture. It was a shadow. 
most Christians don't do this, but they, they sort of follow, they sort of walk around and they say, oh God, lead me. You know what I mean? It's not like the Shekinah going, well, he's moving and so we're moving. You know, he's my life, so I'm with him. He's, he's, you know, he's my joy, so I'm joyful. He is my, you know, weeping for someone else, so I weep. You kind of get the picture of what I'm saying. Where, whatever, however he leads, that's us because we're his body. We're not, we're not just a bunch of individuals trying to get hold of God anymore. Mo, that's, that's the beginning of what Moses' tabernacle represents. All right. And so, um, um, and then I had a, a little, you, you see the chart here, I had a little niche of a place put right in here between Moses' tabernacle and David's tabernacle, or let's say, wait a minute, yeah, between it, and it's just this little place where there was an addendum to um, Moses' tabernacle and David's tabernacle. <clears throat> I've told you the story, but I want to add just a little part to that. And that is that Moses' tabernacle now was in the land, and it was at Shiloh. <clears throat> and at Shiloh, you remember, and I've told it already twice here in the last two sessions, where the Philistines came out against them and they grabbed the ark and they took the ark outside of the tabernacle thinking that this was all about God and he was big and strong and he would do it. But let me, I'm just going to tell you, God is not trying to be big and strong outside of us. He's trying to be strong in us. You know, even in the Old Testament, great in the midst is the Holy One of Israel. Anybody know that song? You know, if you don't know the word. <clears throat> and um, most Christians, frankly, folks, they look what, you know, if you say, okay, well, let's just talk to God or let's just trust in God, you know, they look knowingly, okay, you know, they're not a branch to the vine. They're not connected in. They're not, uh, they're not trusting in his life within them. And I know Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God. I'm not discounting that. But I'm telling you, they made a mistake when they pulled the Lord out of his temple because he came down and he set it up and he said, I will dwell among you and this is how I'm going to dwell among you. I'm going to dwell inside of my tabernacle, my, as it were, temple. Not quite yet, but um, we'll, we'll explain all that as we go. So there's this addendum. It's, it is right in between Moses' tabernacle and David's tabernacle. And what happens is, the ark is outside of Moses' tabernacle, and it's not in David's tabernacle. And this is, this little area right here, this is the times of the Gentiles. This little area right there is where they... Uh, you know what, I don't want to explain this too much. I don't want to get into the spiritual meaning yet. But it is the times of the Gentiles. You've read that, but you know we always go, well, the times of the Gentiles are going to happen during the uh, great tribulation of the, when the moon's in the lower grud and the mountains start to heave or something. I don't know, you know. And we get off into all this weird stuff instead of realizing that the, that the reality of these things comes from Christ. And if we don't see Jesus, we're, you know, I'm sorry, we're not seeing the full truth because, see, we're looking, we're looking for the truth meaning truths. We need to be looking for the truth. And Christ is the truth. And he's the fulfillment. So how in the world... Can we believe in something outside of him who is the fulfillment? And I'm, I won't get into that any more than that, but I'll just say that, um, uh, that that next class we'll get into this little area of the times of the Gentiles and exactly why there was this separation and this period of time between one tabernacle and the other. Because it does seem strange, doesn't it? Because the way I had the timeline drawn when we began the class, it was just Moses' tabernacle, David's tabernacle, Solomon's temple. There's nothing but tabernacle or temple at every given moment, glory to God. But no, 
That's not true. There's this period where he's not in, either, in, in any of those. And uh, as I said, we'll explain that. All right. Um, and uh, let's see. All right. So, da so then David brings, David goes down and he gets the ark. And whatever it was in David's heart, you know, God had set up for the ark to be in that tabernacle. God set that up in the wilderness. But whatever it was in David's heart, he, okay, he saw something different. He saw God wanted something different. Okay, now, now let me explain that to you. Let me just show you how hard a leap that is for most Christians or for David or for anyone else. God says to Moses, set up the tabernacle. Do it this way. Build it this way, right? You're familiar with the Old Testament, man. And I mean, God is minute in his details and everything. And, and you know, uh, right off the bat, after they get it all set up, uh, a couple of the sons of Aaron offer strange fire and boom, they're dead. Right, right after. And it's like, oh my God, can we do nothing right? You know, I'm afraid to do anything. Anybody ever felt that way? You know, man, I know, you know, because under the law, that's what you feel, my Lord. It's like, you know, and that, you know, it's described in uh, Hebrews where he starts talking about, you know, when they, Moses went out and got the Ten Commandments and there was fire and voices and loud yelling and javelin, you know, all this kind of stuff, and you, you know, and that's how he's describing the law. And then he describes, but you are not come to um, Mount Sinai, but you're come to where? Sinai. Okay, and um, so, uh, so, da so M Moses, you know, David was a young man. Moses was an older dude, you know. Moses heard from God first. Moses, this was God and had been God for a long time. And David's just a young guy, but David's hearing from the Lord. And David's getting this feeling that God himself wants something more. But nobody's plugging into the Lord. They're all just keeping up with the system. You following? Nobody's going, I want to know the heart of the Lord. But David did because God said he did. God said he had a heart after me. He, he's, his heart is after me. And so David has got to make a leap when he's bringing back that ark, he's got to make a leap, and it's a huge leap. And when he does it, and he's doing it as king, he's the new king, you know, you mess up right off the bat, you're out, dude. <laughs> he's the new king. And he says, let's, and that's, I put the scripture up last time. Um, let's see if I got it just so you can have it. Uh, it's in 2 Corinthians 6.17. And he's, so he's bringing it back and he says, let's take it to my house. <laughs> well, what kind of deal is that? I mean, think if you're all the religious, pharisaical, priestly, you know, and you've been down at, the, at, at Moses' tabernacle in Shiloh and you've been assigned by God. And who the heck is this guy? You know, David is not of the tri a tribe of Levi. He's of the tribe of Judah. Well, there was somebody else that was of the tribe of Judah too. I can't remember his name. Oh, yeah, it was Jesus. And... Uh, <clears throat> But, you know, don't you know that they're all, oh, what? that's not according to God. That's not according to the word. That's not according to what God has told us. Yeah, we've got to do this the right way. We've got to do everything right. You can't be messing with these kind of things, you know. And David, he would never have made that leap unless he really heard from God. And I'm telling you, absolutely, he wouldn't have. He wouldn't have. And you won't either. You have to hear from God. And you have to hear from God, you know. And I'm sure the first time he started hearing from God on that, he kind of went, am I crazy? I mean, can this really be the way it's supposed to be? 
is this really the truth? Can, do you believe that he probably did go through that and think, you know, I must be crazy. Nobody else thinks like this. I'm sure he did. I'm sure he agonized and went through all that kind of stuff. But the scales get tipped, you know what I mean? At first, it's just a little bit, you know, the, the law and everything is weighing you down, and it's heavier, and there's just a few crumbs from the Lord. But eventually, he keeps showing you and showing you and showing you, and starts tipping the scales until there's more with us than there are with them, until you realize this is the heart of God, and I, care, I don't care what happens. I want to be with the Lord. You know, and it's not, it's not that I want everybody to think like I do or any of that. That's not it. It is not it at all. It is I want the Lord, and I'm going to follow the Lord as I'm seeing him. And the way I'm seeing him, he wants to be with us. You know. And uh, I don't want to get into it too much, but, you know, they set the tabernacle up at Shiloh. And then they all spread all over Israel, right? Shiloh wasn't in the middle. It wasn't central. So it was a complete reversal of what they had in the wilderness where he was right in the middle. But Zion became, the, for God, the center of the whole earth. <laughs> you read it. Read the Psalms and read what he says about it. The center of the whole earth, and he put David plopped him right down there. Right down there, he said, "Okay, let's do this." <clears throat> um, he not only does that, but he doesn't bring up the rest of the tabernacle, Moses' tabernacle. He doesn't bring the altar up. He didn't bring anything up, but just the tent for the. And, and basically, it's the Holy of Holies. In other words, in other words, Moses' tabernacle and David's tabernacle are the same tabernacle but split. I'll explain it here in a second. Moses' tabernacle after they lost the ark. They didn't have the Holy of Holies anymore. They didn't. You say, well, they had the thing. Yeah, but it's empty. There's nothing in there. There's nothing in there. God's not in there. Where's God? Well, he's up there in David's little thing. You know, what's David got going on over there? David had the Holy of Holies. And they had all the other parts. So, so I just, you know, I'm just trying to point out something here, and that is, see, we always think, okay, God did away with Moses' tabernacle, and he started a whole new thing called David's tabernacle. See, that's how we think as Christians, because we've been taught to think that way, that Christianity is just a completely different thing than Judaism instead of the fulfillment of something. Therefore, it really is the real of what that was. And, you, ch you, you know, you check uh, the book of Acts out. Folks, those people that, that came to the Lord in the book of Acts, they didn't, say, they didn't feel like they were leaving Judaism. <laughs> they felt like they were living in the fulfillment of, Jude of what it meant. Right? And so, so that mentality is carried over with Moses' tabernacle and David's tabernacle. We think one is destroyed and a new, whole new kind of thing is raised up. But in reality, it is the Moses' tabernacle is not destroyed. The most important part becomes what James calls, we will build again the tabernacle of David. And that became the answer to every Jew who understood not only the law, but understood the history and the historical emphasis of what had happened. This is not something new. This is bringing forth the thing that God wants to emphasize, the Holy of Holies, a tent where God dwells. 
You see what I'm saying? And so, um, all right. Let me make sure. All right. And then, and then just finally, <clears throat> we'll close with this. I didn't drink anything. Y'all notice how skinny I'm getting? Shay's the only one to notice I cut my hair. <laughs> and then finally, after a period of time, David has got this tent in his backyard and he's been enjoying, he's been enjoying the Lord. He's been going into the Holy of Holies. You're not even supposed to go in there unless you're the high priest and only once a year. And he's talking about going in there and doing, you know, just spending time with the Lord all the time. How I love your, you know, tabernacle and all this stuff. That's why he talks that way because my God, he's doing something you shouldn't even be able to do. <clears throat> but, but that goes for a while. And then David, man of God that he is, and heart after God, not just man of God, heart after God that he has, he is, he remains open to the Lord. He doesn't just get fixed. Okay, well, I found something new that they don't know. and He doesn't get fixed. He, he, he starts grieving for the Lord again. I think there's something more for the Lord. See, we're always going, I think there's something more for us. I want everything God's got. Well, what about everything God wants, you know? And, and he starts thinking, man, you know, and this is David. I, I, I got my own house built of cedar, and it's a great house, but God doesn't have a house. God should have a house. And something in him said, there's still something greater than this. This tent on Zion is wonderful, but there's still still meant to be something greater than the tabernacle of Moses, even greater than the tabernacle of David. And his heart begins to yearn, and he begins to, and so he, he, he goes to one of the prophets, and he says, I want to, you know, I want to build a house for the Lord. And the, the Lord answers and says, it's good that it was in your heart because it hadn't been in anybody else's heart. <laughs> no one else really has checked in on me. They just want me to check in on them. I mean, don't you know he loved David? And he says that in the scripture. He loved David. It also says David loved the Lord. But <clears throat> so the next progression, the stage is set for the next progression. God says Solomon's going to build a temple. A temple. No longer a tabernacle. There's going to be, and here we go, something new. Right? But not new. Isn't the temple just a, a, an expanded version of the tabernacle? And the answer is absolutely. I mean, check, check it out. <laughs> You know, you got the labor, you got the altar, you got all the same stuff in there. It's just, it's just more expanded. It's like God's got a bigger house. You know. And Solomon's temple, though these other temples that we talked about, Solomon's temple is the pinnacle of the reality of what God really had in mind in the sense of temple, in the sense of temple. All right, so next class, we're going to, um, that's the historical perspective of that. What do I call it? Historical and spiritual progression of the house of God. Um, um, we're going to, let me just say this on this timeline chart. This is actually just a shadow. And we see that shadow, and we see the Lord in that shadow, and we think that's the fulfillment, or that's how it's fulfilled. But I'm going to show you where the true fulfillment of this stuff came on. And actually, on an actual historical timeline, this reality 
or this shadow became reality at a completely different juncture than all of this, but it was the same order. And I'll explain that as we go. But it's like, it's not where we think it is. It's where God puts this stuff so that we see Christ. We don't just see Christ in truth. That's so important. We don't just see Christ in shadows and lay him over that. No, sir. That is just a shadow of a, of a whole new uh, spiritual reality that really is set on a completely different timeline, though in the same order as these things. So we'll explain all that and get into it next time. Be in prayer and keep your, you know, be in prayer that our hearts, not just yours, don't just pray for you, but be in prayer that our hearts um, will, like David, want us to see what God has in his heart and that we can walk in those paths like David did and we can help bring about the true fulfillment because that, that was in David's heart, but folks, that, that Solomon's temple wasn't the true fulfillment. It was the closest picture, but it wasn't the true fulfillment. David's tabernacle? No, David's tabernacle was never the, the fulfillment. Um, uh, that didn't come about until the book of Acts. Let us build again. And there's the true David's tabernacle. You see what I mean? That's why it's, it's jumping timelines in a sense, but the truth is there. So anyway, sorry. Father, we just ask you to tenderize our hearts and, and open our eyes. We admit that we know nothing yet as we ought, but we as the family of God sit down together and we sit at your table and we ask you to feed us from the things that you eat, the, the things that you enjoy and satisfy you and, and open our hearts and give us a taste for the things that satisfy you instead of the, satis the things that satisfy us. And um, Lord, make our, our hearts like wax that just melt before you, that melt before the sun and that are not hard and stiff against you, but ready to uh, accept the cross and the resurrection as you see it, so that the fullness, the fullness and the fulfillment of the things that you're after can be seen in the church. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.